So let's go ahead and stand this morning. Great to see you. Let's start with Near the Cross, and we'll sing all three of these verses together. Jesus, keep me near the cross. On the first. Jesus, keep me near the cross and a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul interesting concept in our Christian lives. We come to the cross first as it was Jesus' cross that he laid down his life, he died for us. We should never get too far from that. Never remember every day of your lives. Never never forget that without that we would not have salvation. And then the cross becomes for us. Jesus says he wants us to take up our cross. It's a cross of suffering. Even as he suffered, we are called to suffer. We're called to identify with him in every way possible. We're not going to lay down our lives for the sins of the world. That's done. But we are called to suffer with him. And so the cross is an interesting concept in our lives that we should embrace it. We should, there is a, even though it is abhorrent to some people, oh, I don't want to suffer, there is a sweet fellowship that we have with Jesus, that he will He will meet with us in a special way. Let's sing, I am resolved no longer to linger all three of these verses together. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are lower, these have lowered my side.
on the last. I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. I will hasten to him, hasten to God and free. I am resolved. If we don't resolve ahead of time, we probably won't do it. If we wait till the middle of a temptation to decide which way we're going to go, we know what our flesh will choose. So uh, we need to, that's part of what church is for. We come together. Before we go out into the week, we say, I'm resolved to follow Jesus this week. And there's someone else beside me that's resolving the same thing, and we can pray for each other. All right, let's sing one more song on the back side of your sheet. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Forever. We'll sing all the way through it a couple of times. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. My mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations from the top. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Let's sing all that one more time. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy Why should we do that? Why should we sing about his mercies forever? Because it says in Lamentations 3, it's of those mercies that we are not consumed. The fact that we are here today is because of the mercy of God. So if you didn't know it, you woke up today with something to sing about. The mercies of God. We're so thankful and grateful for his goodness, kindness, his patience, his mercy. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Wonderful singing today. And at this time, the choir is going to come and sing for us.
Amen. I don't know if we can even get close to imagining what it's like in heaven. We see a couple of places in the Bible where we get glimpses, Isaiah 6 and some in the book of Revelation, where they see the Lord high and lifted up. He's so high that angels can't even look at him. With six wings, they do what they do, and two of the wings cover their faces because his glory is so transcendent. And so may we, whenever we come and meet together, whenever we pray, that it's never a flippant thing. We serve the most glorious God of the whole universe. And just because he has seen fit to come down and become human, just because he has uh, come to dwell inside of us, doesn't mean that he is any less transcendent or worthy of our awe. And so may we uh, worship the Lord. All right, let's um, open together this morning in a word of prayer, and then we're going to be starting a new series. We're not going to uh, start into a new book of the Bible yet for this series. I, I think the next one we're going to do is going to be the book of Zechariah, an Old Testament book, and so we will do that as soon as we're done. I'm going to start a new series today that's probably going to go for seven weeks, and I'm entitling the series Right with God, and it's going to be a study on holiness and sin and the need for us as believers to daily come before him. We're going we're gonna to split up sin into several different category, categories. We're going to be categorizing sin, but not in the wrong way, hopefully. But there are, sometimes we say, God, I pray that you'd forgive me all of my sin today. And what does that even mean? And we don't get very specific. So we're going to spend some time in this series getting specific in our own lives, I pray, and as we come before God. So this morning is going to be a little bit of an introduction to the series. I've entitled it, The Need for Holiness in Our Lives. And so let's pray. We'll ask God to bless our time in his word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to know you, the God of the whole universe. We can't even yet imagine how high and lofty you are. You tell us that you have to humble yourself even to behold the things that are in heaven. You have to come down just to look at the things that are in heaven and the things in heaven are too high for us to see right now. Help us to know the transcendence of God, that you are high and holy and yet you come down to dwell with us. But you tell us that if we are going to be able to fellowship with you, if we are going to meet with you, it has to be on your terms. We need to be holy. We need to be cleansed. I pray that we would do that even this morning. I pray that as we walk through this series, you'd give us a greater appreciation of your holiness. Give us a greater horror of our own sin and the break that it makes between us and a holy God. I pray that you would help us to draw closer to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's start in Psalm 100 this morning. Psalm 100, I want to read all of this, verses 1 through 5. And it shows the joy that whenever we gather together in God's name, the joy and the singing and the celebration that we should have whenever we do this. So here's Psalm 100. And by the way, I would say that this applies not just when we gather together, but when you're all by yourself and you meet with God, when you open the Bible, when you pray, this ought to be the heart that we have. So it says this, Psalm 100, a psalm of praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. By the way, some people, when we sing, that's what you could call it. It's a joyful noise. It was just, Some people might just call it a bunch of noise, but uh, it was joyful at least. And hopefully that was a sweet sound in God's ears. Isn't it wonderful, by the way, that God doesn't see or hear as man sees and hears? Uh, anybody in the world, the world, you could get up on American Idol and you could get booed off the stage because you sound so horrible. And God could say, keep on singing. I love that. I love when you sing to me. Conversely, someone could get up and win American Idol and God would say, that sounds horrible to me. I don't. Uh, I, because it came from that heart of that person. So God doesn't hear as we do. But make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. 
Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Uh, it's a beautiful psalm that they would sing when they, were, they would go and worship the Lord at the tabernacle or at the temple, whatever they had available to them at the time. And the heart here is that God is so wonderful and good, the fact that he meets with us and dwells with us, that ought to thrill our hearts. It should never be a drudgery to go and worship and serve the Lord. It shouldn't be like pulling teeth. Oh, I'd rather, you know, like when you see those bumper stickers, I'd uh, sport chalet. I'd rather be skiing. I'd rather be playing soccer, whatever it may be. Don't be like that when it comes time to be with God. Oh, I'd, I'd rather be watching TV. The, it's the greatest joy that we should have to come before the presence of God, that he, though he is so high, would come down and allow us to be able to meet with him and worship him. So there is that aspect of joy that should fill our hearts whenever we come to God. And yet, there is more to it than that. If I can, if I can put it this way, there should be something that comes before this. The reason we have joy, it says later on in the, in the psalm, be thankful in, in him and bless his name for his good, for his mercy is everlasting. It's because of things like this, his mercy. But there's something that comes before being able to come and worship him. And there should be a holy solemnity that we have. By the way, I'm not saying that you come to church and your face looks like you've been dipped in prune juice and, you know, you just ate something exceedingly sour. That's how some people come to church. It's very austere and Blessed be the Lord, holy brethren. You know, and, and some people refuse to smile. They think it's sacrilegious to smile around the things of God. And so we need a balance. There is joy, but there's not a flippancy about meeting with God. And there's definitely not a flippancy about our sin. And so I want to talk about this morning the need for holiness as we come before the Lord and the need for holiness every day in our lives. And the word holy is a dirty word for a lot of people. Ugh, holy. It just, it means there's stuff I can't do that I want to do. It means there's stuff that I have to give up. I don't want to be holy. I want to have fun. I want to enjoy life. And some people think those are your two options. You can either enjoy life or you can be holy. And like a monk that has a vow of poverty and celibacy and silence and never gets to do anything fun in life. That is not the picture of holiness. And by the way, let me say this. Everyone believes in holiness to some extent. I'd, uh, maybe I'd say almost everyone. I'm going to give you an illustration of this in just a minute. And almost everyone is on board, even if they hate God, even if they don't believe in God. They believe in holiness and the context determines, because what does the word holy mean? If I could use one definition of holiness, it would be this. To be set apart or different from something else. And this is what we'd say about God, that he is holy. One definition someone's given is that he is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. He is holy or totally other. God is other than everything. There's, there's no one that's like God. There's nothing that's like God. That's part of why God says, don't make a graven image. Because if you make a graven image and say, this is God, you just, there's nothing like God. And whenever we make, you can't, you don't know what God looks like. So when you make something that looks like something that you know, and you say, this is God, you've already lowered God because God doesn't look like that. God is different from everything. And when we talk about holiness, what we mean is God is different from sin. God is totally different from anything that is sinful. He is much higher than that. He is above that. He is holy and he is set apart from sin. God is set apart totally 
to righteousness and goodness and holiness. He's totally set apart from sin. But everyone believes in holiness. Here's a good passage. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Maybe my favorite passage that talks about the need for holiness and helps us to define what holiness is. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to read verses 19 through 21. And here's what it says. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So this is what holiness is to do. If you're gonna, if you're gonna say that you're a believer and you name the name of Christ, God says, I want you to leave sin. I want you to depart from iniquity. Leave it behind. It's over here. Just walk away from that. Look at verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. And a vessel would be like a pot or a cup or a pitcher or something that you could hold something in. There are vessels that are beautiful and expensive and also some of wood and, and even of earth made out of dirt and some to honor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified, there's our word for holy, same root word, holy, sanctified, or set apart. Sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So it uses the word... Um, Every, every good work. It says if you were to go to a great house, go to, go to a rich person's house, he's got all kinds of vessels. He might have his fine china that he would pull out and serve, you know, if you're having a lady's tea or something like this. He's got expensive things. And he's also got things that are kind of beaten up and worthless, but they have a, they have a use, but they have a different use. It's a vessel unto dishonor. By the way, let me say this in verse 21. If a man purge himself from these, what is that talking about? That's talking about in verse 19 at the end of the verse. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And if a man will depart from iniquity or purge himself from sin, then he, sh he shall be a vessel unto honor. So when you go to a house, I have an illustration this morning of a couple of different types of vessels. And one is more expensive than the other. Now, I don't know how expensive. I don't even know where this came from. Is it crystal? Probably not. It's probably glass. But it, the way that it's designed, it looks super expensive. Anyway, And we use this to put things in that we drink. Now, it doesn't have to be expensive things. We'll put water in here sometimes or lemonade or tea. Anyway, we'll, we'll put things in here. We'll pour it out and then we'll drink it. And then I have another vessel. This is a a cup that is used for pool chemicals, some various and sundry powdered or granular pool chemicals. And because of the things that have been in here, I wouldn't advise drinking out of this. This has had, this has had poisonous things in here, things that I can't even pronounce, you know, things that, uh, that if you were to sometimes combine them with other things, you could have an explosion. These are uh, poor things in that kill harmful things in water. The things that have been in here will kill. And so if I were to say, who's thirsty? And you raise your hands. And I fill both of these up with the same thing. You wouldn't want to drink out of this because this is what we call, what the Bible calls a vessel unto dishonor. Now it's got a purpose. I wouldn't use this when it comes time to, to use pool chemicals. Let's see, I'm going to dump something in the pool. Let me... Let me scoop this up and pour it in the pool. Now I have disqualified this from other uses. Now, no more would I put something wonderful to drink in here and drink, because now this is poisonous. It's been contaminated. It's been disqualified from certain uses. Now, you say, well, I could, I could cleanse it and purify it, and that's kind of the point. This one, this has got faded paint on it. I don't think no matter how many times I put this in the dishwasher or sanitize it, I don't think I'd ever want to drink anything out of this. Just, uh, I know where it's been, you know. But the wonderful thing about God 
is that we can go from this to this. We don't have to be permanently disqualified from his use. You can go from being now in a great house, if you have a vessel of earth or, you know, whatever, or if you have a vessel of gold or silver, that's pretty much that. It, the die is cast on that, and, and this is always going to be one thing, this is always going to be another. But in the Christian life, we can be either one. Let me say this, any one of us can be either one. And we get to choose if we are a vessel unto honor that God wants to use, or we get to choose if we're going to be a vessel unto dishonor. Now, in the moment, we don't get to choose. If we're living our lives in sin and we're like this, and all of a sudden God wants to do something with someone to glorify his name, God wants to reach down and grab a vessel to pour the water of the gospel on someone, that, that type of thing. When God reaches down, we don't get you to just decide in the moment, God, use me. God reaches down and says, no, well, I'd like to, but I can't right now. You're a vessel into dishonor. But if you would purge yourself from these sins, you can be cleansed. You can be now sanctified. See, we don't often use the word sanctified, but this is holiness. And everyone believes in holiness. Nobody in the world, even an unbeliever, nobody wants to go and grab a dirty vessel and drink out of it. He wants something clean. He wants something sanitized. And that's, and God is no different from that. God wants to use someone... Now, God can, if he, God can use anyone to do anything. He can use a donkey to speak his will. God could use stones. Jesus said if, if uh, people would stop praising me, the very stones would cry out. God can use anything. But he, he chooses to use vessels that are clean. And it says the word meat or fit. You are fit for the master's use if you are sanctified, if you are set apart from sin. But if not... God, if I can use this word, this phrase, God wouldn't touch you with a 10-foot pole right now when it comes to doing something for his glory. Now, he wants to use all of us, and he wants to cleanse us. And if somebody's an unbeliever, there, there's nobody that's too far from being saved by God. There's no one that's too far from being cleansed and being used by God. But we make the choice. It says, if a man purge himself from these. Now, God's got to do the cleansing, but we have to yield ourselves to God. We have to say, God, will you cleanse me? Will you forgive me? And we choose whether we are on the shelf available to be used by God or whether we're not. So look at Psalm 139. If you would turn there, Psalm 139. Here's a wonderful prayer that we can pray any time of the day. Psalm 139, verse 23. And let's read 23 and 24. Here's what it says. It's an invitation. You know, God invites us to do certain things. Come, take the water of life freely. And this is kind of an invitation to God to come and do things in our lives. It says, search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Do you ever pray a prayer like that and give God permission, if I can use that, that word? Because God never tramples on our free will, by the way. He is the sovereign God of the whole universe. But he never saves anyone that doesn't want to be saved. He never saves anyone that doesn't want to believe in him, that doesn't want to call on him. He respects our free will. Do we give God permission and say, God, I, you come and search me and try me. See if there's any wicked way in me. God, if there is anything in my life that displeases you, I give you the authority. I give you the permission to come into my life and show it to me. And I promise that I will confess it. I promise that I'll ask forgiveness for that. What a beautiful invitation. Do you ever give God an invitation to just clean house and do anything in your life? Just give God, it's like writing him a blank check. There's a blank check. I sign my name to it. God, you take it and you fill in the amount. And when you're filling in the amount, I'm not going to look over your shoulder. Oh, that's a little bit much. 
God, you're going to go and you're going to go in that room of my life and clean. Uh, I, what I meant was you can you can clean here, but don't go over there. You know that's often the way we do. We we have contingencies with God. This verse just says, God, my whole life. Here it is. Show me if there's any wicked way, and I will give it to you, and I will confess it. In Ezra chapter 9, I'm trying to decide if we want to, let's go ahead and, and read this passage. The attitude of Ezra is really instructive to us. The nation of Israel is coming back into Israel. They've been in Babylon for 70 years. And why did God send them back to Israel? Was it because they got their lives cleaned up and God says, okay, you, you guys have done a good job now that you're following me. Now I'll send you back into the land. The reason they went back is because God had already promised you'll be gone for 70 years and then I'll send you back. And 70 years are up, so God sends them back. But they're still walking in wickedness. And when they go back, they, they go right back into the very thing, one of the very things that got them kicked out of the land in the first place. I think about a video that I've seen before. I, I think I've shared it with some of you. There's a long ditch that's about this wide and it has a sheep in it that's about this wide and this the second half of the sheep is sticking up out of this ditch and he's kind of bah, bah, and needs help and a guy reaches down and grabs the back legs and pulls him out of the ditch and he is so happy and he bounds away and in about three bounds he, he leaps and he goes shunk, right back into the ditch as soon as he was freed he went right back thought, that is a picture of what we do in the christian life all we like sheep have gone astray. We're dumb. Sheep do dumb stuff. And so God delivers us and we do it again. And that's what's happening in Ezra. So look at Ezra chapter 9 and verse 1. Let's read down through verse 6. We'll see what Israel is going through, what they're involved in. And the main thing I'll look at is Ezra's attitude, his response to sin. Now, he's looking at the sin of other people, but what I want us to do is to say, can we have this attitude toward our own sin? It's easy to do this for other people, right? No, oh, man, look at that guy over there. Let, let's pray for him. But how often do we say, look what I have done? So look at Ezra 9, verse 1. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites, who should know better, have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Stalagmites, and the Stalactites, no, I'm sorry, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. So there's a description of their sin. They're marrying the heathen. God said this Old Testament and New Testament, do not marry the heathen. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You can marry anybody that you want to only in the Lord. At the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, uh, it says if someone is married and then their spouse dies and they're, and they're released from, they're no longer under that covenant, they can go and they can be married to anybody they want to except it's got to be in the Lord. So by the way, that's a good verse. People ask people ask things like this. What about interracial marriage? Should people that are of different races get married? And uh, my answer to that is no. Interracial marriage is wrong, but good thing that all people are of the human race. There's only one race. We're all made of one blood. So there is nothing in the Bible that would say that someone from this country or this nationality should not marry another. It says you can marry anybody you want to. This, I think it's verse 39, 1 Corinthians 7, 39. He, be, he may be married to whomsoever he will, only in the Lord. They both need to be believers. Uh, and so in the Old Testament, God, basically there were Israelites and then there were the heathen, all the nations. Now, if someone got saved, the Bible says this, they could, they could come in and, and marry an Israelite once they were saved. And you see people doing that. You see Ruth in the Bible. You see Rahab the harlot doing that and other people. And they even come into the genealogy of Christ. So interracial marriage was not wrong in the Old Testament or the New Testament, but you were to not mingle with the heathen. So that's what they've done. Look what Ezra responds with. It says, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment 
and my mantle, that the mantle would be like this outward blanket type of thing that would be around his clothing, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished or astonished. Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities have increased over our head and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. What a picture. Now, we don't often do this. This is kind of, some of this is cultural. Some of this is the way that they would express grief or sorrow so that people would know that they are sorrowful over sin or over a tragedy or over a loss. People would often rip rip their clothes. Now, I've never done this over sin. I'm not necessarily advocating it. Uh, I'm definitely not advocating if it makes someone immodest, you know, and definitely don't go rip someone else's clothes. They won't appreciate that. But this is what they would do. They would sometimes put earth or sackcloth. They would clothe themselves with sackcloth and put earth on their heads and do things to show that they were very sorrowful. And so he is just beside himself. He can't believe that they've done this. It it goes on to say later in the passage that these are the same things that got us in trouble in the first place. How can we come back again and do it again after God has brought us back and he hasn't punished us He's punished us with less than our iniquities deserve. After all of that, how could we go back again and do the same thing? And so Ezra, he is just broken over his sin, over the sin of the nation, over the sin of his people, so that he can't even look up to God. I'm too ashamed to even look up. I blush to lift up my face because of our sin. What a picture there. We're overcome. Our iniquities are increased over our head, and it's grown up to the heavens. The Bible says this in multiple places. Did you know that your sin goes up to heaven, and it cries out to God for judgment? It says this in multiple places. When Cain had killed Abel, God says, His blood is crying out to me from the ground for judgment has to be judged. It said this about Sodom and Gomorrah when God came and met with Abraham. He says, I've come down because the cry is great. The cry of their sin is great and has come up to me and I've come down to see what needs to be done. Our sin cries out to God for judgment and it doesn't stop until something is done. And here it says that our sin is grown up unto the heavens. It is an offense to God. It's a stench in his nostrils. And God must do something about sin, about our sin. And so, do we ever have an attitude like this? Or we're, off, we're in a world that doesn't think much about sin, right? And, has even, and thinks even less and less about sin than they used to. If you go back 50, 100 years ago in our nation, and people would blush to talk about the things that now are just commonplace things that are on TV, the things that people in, in mixed company and groups were very different. We've, we've moved the line, and maybe if I can put it this way, if this represents the church, the people of God, and this represents the world, the world has moved further from God, and we have moved. Now, we're still further from the world. We're still not exactly the same as the world, but we've kept about the same distance, and now we're further from God in the way that Christians think about things than what they used to. And God has not moved, and God will never move. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Every And this is why when people say, oh, the Bible, that's, uh, that's kind of passe. It's old-fashioned. No, the Bible is reality. It shows where God always has been and always will be. And whenever we think that the Bible is passe, it shows that we've left it behind and we're leaving God behind. But God will never move. And God calls us 
to come away from the world and even to come away from other people that call themselves believers that are believers. If they're drifting, God calls us to come away from them. God calls us to come away from sin. Now, God doesn't call us to abandon sinners that need the gospel. And Jesus didn't abandon sinners. Jesus was wrongly accused by the Jews of hobnobbing. Of, they even accuse him of being a wine-bibber and a friend of sinners. And Jesus says, well, I'm actually, what I'm doing is I'm calling them to repentance. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I can't call people to repentance unless I go to where they are and call them to repentance. So God doesn't tell us to abandon unbelievers, but he tells us to abandon sin. And he tells us, and, and he, he tells us to abandon close fellowship with those who are doing sin uh, unless we are calling them to repentance. We live in a world that has moved and changed, but God doesn't. And the question is, are we going to still have an attitude like Ezra did toward our sin, or are we going to allow whatever the world thinks about our sin to define our attitude? Well, they, I do it, and they don't think it's a big deal, so I guess maybe it's not a big deal. But by the way, the world does think it's a big deal when believers do it. They just don't think it's a big deal when they do it. They don't want to be judged. But if a believer does it, they're very willing to point out, hey, I thought you, you shouldn't be living like that. And they would say, oh, I didn't think it was a big deal because you didn't think it was a big deal. The world, they have a double standard. And we need to not join in with their double standard. We need to, to keep close to God. Our greatest need in life is twofold. First of all, it comes in salvation. Our greatest need in life is to know God, to be saved, to be part of his family, and to know him in that way. And then the second part, but it's still part of that greatest need, first of all, is to know who he is, what he is like. And then the second need is for us to be like him. And remember what we've sung this morning, what we've already said, there's nobody like him. So here we have a catch-22, or it's kind of a paradox in the Christian life. Our greatest need is to be like God, but there's nobody like God. And yet he commands us to be like him, even though that is impossible on our own in this life. And yet it is commanded. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. You know, the Catholic Church often does this. They pick out their favorite people and they call them saints. They wait till they're dead and they have to have a couple of qualifications. They have to have performed a couple of miracles. So sometimes people, if they can't uh, figure out a miracle, sometimes they've made up a couple things so they can get upgraded to saint status after their death. But anyways, um, but some people think that there's run-of-the-mill Christians, and then there's upper echelon Christians, and one day you might even be a saint. And that's not the way that the Bible uses the word saint. The Bible says that if you are saved, you are a saint. You're already there. You don't have to wait for two miracles. They might not come. But God says that you are called a saint and called to be a saint. So look at Romans 1 and verse 7. Here's what it says. To all that be in Rome beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of these are synonymous with that they are believers, they're saved people, and they're called saints. This is, Here it says called to be saints, other places it says I'm writing to all the saints that are in Corinth and so forth. The word saint, we get the word sanctify, it's, it's a, it's a, sister root word, and it comes from the same root word, the word saint, and the word sanctify, and the word holy. They all come in Greek from the same root word, and it means the same thing, that you are set apart by God. When, whenever someone is saved, they are set apart from sin, and they're set apart unto God. By the way, there's, there's two parts to holiness. You can't be set apart to God unless you're set apart from sin. Because God's over here and sin's over here. And you can't bring sin with you to God. So to be set apart to God, first of all, you're set apart from sin so that you can be set apart to God. And for Christians that think 
that sanctification or holiness is a dirty word. Holy is this dirty four-letter letter word that I don't like to think about because it means I can't do that anymore. The reason that it's so wonderful to leave sin behind and come apart is so that we can be sanctified unto God, so that we can meet with him, so that we can be used by him. That's a great, wonderful privilege, and it's worth leaving sin behind for. You can't do both at the same time. Like somebody can't win the Olympics while, uh, depending on what sport, you know, there's some sports that maybe shouldn't be sports. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there are some uh, great athletic feats. If you're going to win in the Olympics, like the 100 meter dash or something like this, if you're going to win these sprints or these great feats of strength, you can't be sitting on your couch all day, living a potato couch, uh, live, eating potato chips and being a, a couch potato uh, and eating and drinking, you know, ice cream and milkshakes and whatever else all day, every day. And then the day of, hop up on the starting line and win the race. Doesn't happen. It has never happened. I'm not a prophet, but I'll probably say it will never happen. That somebody never exercises, never trains. They only eat junk and then they win the 100 meter dash. It doesn't happen. You can't win that and hold on to that at the same time. But if you have a good perspective, that crown or that reward is worth leaving potato chips behind. And even strawberry milkshakes. You know, it's worth to leave that behind for what you get out of it. And God is worth leaving sin behind. It doesn't matter, well, what about this sin? It's so enjoyable. Any sin is worth leaving it behind for what the reward is. We're not talking about gaining heaven by that, but to have the reward of fellowship with Jesus and his favor and his power and his use for you in life. Because what he gives is eternal, and he addeth no sorrow with it. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Some people have never tasted it. They taste it of the world, and they like it, and it does have consequences. But sometimes the consequences are worth that moment of pleasure. By the way, they're not. But, and, and, the, and sometimes the consequences haven't yet fully come. They think everything's okay. But it's worth leaving all that behind for the joy of walking with God and fellowshipping with him. And we need to know that, that holiness is worth it. The greatest gift that someone can give to those around them, for instance, for a parent, the greatest gift that a father or mother can give their children, what would it be? It's a, a trip to Disneyland. <laughs> Disneyland? Why people... You go in summer, there's a thousand million people there. You're standing in line for hours. It's hot. You're sweating. And then you get on a ride for two minutes, you get dizzy and throw up. And it only costs you $5,000 to do that. Where do I sign up? Yeah. No thank you on Disney. But there's a lot of things that people want to give their children. The greatest thing you can give your children is the example of a holy life. Amen. That you can show them this is possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is rewarded by God. And now they can go on by the it doesn't automatically mean that other people around you will, will do the same thing, but you can show them that this is joyous. I hope that whenever we walk with God, that we do it with joy because we're called to be ambassadors to God. And don't make, don't make the world think that following God is miserable because it's not. Taste and see that the Lord is good. But the greatest gift we can give is a holy life for many reasons. One is that it is an example to them. Two, it's because... The blessing of God can come unto your life and it can flow down to them. The Bible says that the righteous man is blessed, his children are blessed after him, that the righteous, that the blessing of God can, can trickle down to them. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And there's a balance. We, we shouldn't do this with pride and arrogance and say, uh, what you need to do is just follow me because I'm the greatest. It's not about that. But I want to show you the path to blessedness and joy. Please, I've found it. God has found me, and I've found it, so follow me as I follow Christ. By the way, Paul doesn't say, just follow me, but he says, as I follow Christ, I want you to follow me. And God says, I want you to be holy, for I am holy. Jesus says this, be ye holy, for I am holy. I've said this before, I, I did a Greek 
word study on the word holy. The word holy is used there both two times. And it's the same word. It's not that Jesus says, be ye holy for I am holy. He uses the same word. I want, he says, I want you to be as holy as I am. Well, how holy is God? We don't even know the fullness of it, but angels can't look at him. And he is so holy that he has to come down, the book of Psalms says, he who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. He is very high, he's holy, separate from sin. And he uses the same word for us. He says, I want you to be just as holy as I am. How can you do that? Well, we, we've been given the Holy Spirit inside of us. He is our enablement. He is our power to do this. But we need to yield. It doesn't happen automatically. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says this, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. That's all of us. If you're saved here today, you have been specifically called by God to a life of holiness. And by the way, one thing that throws out that that's a boring life is that Jesus says, I want you to have my joy. I will that my joy might remain in you. Jesus was full of joy. He is the source of joy. There's no joy in the universe apart from God. Well, how about the people that are laughing and happy and smiling that don't like him? It's not joy. It's temporary happiness based on happenings. But if the happiness, if the happenings go away, the happiness goes away. But God gives us joy that rises above all of this, and it's found in holiness. Instead of it being the opposite, instead of it being holiness over here or joy here, it's found in holiness. Joy is found in holiness. And so when God says, I have called you unto holiness, he's also called us unto joy. He wants us to find them there together. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That means your lifestyle. In every area of your life. Not some. Well, when I'm at church on Sunday mornings, I'm going to be holy. Because I don't want them to think I'm, you know, I'm on a, I'm a low-level Christianity. I want people to think that I'm super spiritual. So on Sunday morning, holy. But Saturday night? Saturday night? You want me to be holy on Saturday night? No, it says in all manner of conversation, in every area of your life, God wants us to be holy. We mentioned this, but in Isaiah 6, 3, the angels are there. It says, and one cried to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And one of the definitions of sin is that it is a lack of holiness. They help define each other. Holiness is being separate from sin. Sin is when we, do, when we lack holiness and we're in, involved in the opposite of that. So look at James chapter 1. I'm going to look at a couple of verses here. James 1 verses 23 through 25. God gives us his word to help us with holiness. And holiness starts by realizing your reality, that you're not holy. So look at the illustration it gives here. It gives the illustration of a mirror. James 1, 23. It says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer. You ever been there? I have. Have you ever listened to a Bible verse and then done the opposite? Sometimes I've done the opposite within moments of hearing a Bible verse. Be ye angry and sin not. Be quiet, woman. Leave me alone. I'm reading the Bible. You know, whatever. It means. I don't. I don't. I don't call Melanie woman. But we often do that. We hear the word, but we're not a doer. And if we do that, here's what we do: If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror, for he beholdeth himself. And goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, which is like a mirror, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, or he does what it says to do, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Have you ever done that? 
Have you ever woken up in the morning, looked at yourself in the mirror, whoa, who is that? That's me. And then, uh, anyway, I just walk away. Whenever you look in the mirror, just our human nature, it wants to fix what we see. And for some people and for some of us, for some times of the day or some phases of life, it takes longer to fix what we see than at other times. You know, sometimes people you know, feel like, how long did you spend getting ready this morning? Oh, about half an hour. Oh, okay, probably should have spent an hour. You know, uh, But anyway, we, we try to fix what we see. If you hated yourself, you would just look at what you see and say, who cares? You know, maybe you're just lazy. You know, I'm only going to be around these people. Who cares what I look like? Uh, I remember during COVID, a lot of people, they enjoyed the masks. You know, this means I don't have to put on makeup. I'm just going to put on a mask and I'll just, I'm just going to go and be my natural self. Maybe I'll put on a whole face mask, you know, cover everything. Uh, but it takes time to fix things that are wrong. And that's why we don't often do it in, in uh, the spiritual Christian life. It takes humility to acknowledge that's me that I see in the mirror and I need help and I need forgiveness. I need cleansing I am wicked. We don't like to hear this. So that's why a lot of people don't, they don't like to go to church. They don't like to open the Bible. Because that pastor, he's just looking at me the whole time. How come he doesn't preach at anyone else? He's only preaching to me. I've heard people say things like that. You know what that is? That's God's word. That's, God's, that's God like a mirror showing us who we are. We don't like to see it. I don't like to go to church because I just leave feeling guilty all the time. Well, we should feel guilty and then leave not feeling guilty because we confess it while we're there. That's a, We try to always give us opportunity today. I hope that we come and the job of a pastor is to do a couple of things. It's to comfort the afflicted and also to afflict the comfortable. You know, to, to make people that feel good in their sin, to feel miserable about it by opening God's word and saying, this is what is happening. This is what you look like. This is what you look like to God. And people say, well, God doesn't want me to feel guilty. He does. He doesn't want me to stay there. But guilt is the Holy Spirit saying, you need change in your life. And, and guilt is a, is a gift from the Holy Spirit in our lives to say, let's fix it. So if you ever feel guilty about your sin, the devil wants people to feel guilty when they're already forgiven. But before we're forgiven, God wants us to feel guilty to drive us to him. This is why the law was given. The law was given to be our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ Amen. so that we could be forgiven. And guilt is a gift from God. Never slough off the guilt and say, man, I feel bad. Ah, I just God wants me to feel better about who I am. And let me just ignore that. That was the Holy Spirit that you just ignored. And the longer we ignore him, we do damage to our conscience and Pretty soon, you might not feel bad about your sin. That's a, that's a dangerous place to be. That's where someone feels right before they step off a cliff to destruction. So whenever you feel guilty about sin, thank God for it and run to him and say, God, here's who I am. I confess it. This is what I saw in the mirror. And I tried. I can't fix it. Will you fix it? And God will, it's like going to a salon and someone comes out. You don't even recognize them. After a certain makeover, it's like, Wow. What happened? A professional got a hold of me, you know? And God is a professional that can do amazing things in our lives with our sin. He can forgive it. We could never give ourselves a spiritual makeover that pleases God, that's glorifying to God. So I want to have three thoughts. This is going to be short, by the way. We're almost done with our sermon. But now we're going to have our three points, our three thoughts. Number one, we all have, and so we're just going to have one verse or passage with this, with each of these. Look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. First thought is, and this message is for Christians. If someone's not a believer, if you're here today and you're not a believer, the, the greatest need you have in your life is to be forgiven of your sin in salvation. It only takes a moment, the moment that we believe that Jesus has died for our sin and we call upon him. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved in a moment. And once we're saved, this is still true about us. Number one, we all have sin in our lives. We don't graduate from sin. 
We still have our flesh inside of us. We still, and if you, if you doubt this, just ask your spouse. They know. Ask your children. Ask your friends. Ask people around you. I've met some people that have, that have told me I'm sinless in my life. I just, I don't sin anymore. And um, what do you say? You just did, you know. Anyway. But we all have sin. First John chapter 1, verse 8 says this. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So this is true of all unbelievers. This is true of all believers that we still have sin day by day in our lives. Now, I love the illustration that Jesus gives in John 13. The difference now between a believer and an unbeliever is that an unbeliever needs a bath, a shower, needs a whole, he needs to be totally cleansed. But when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he taught Peter this, this truth, that now that you're saved, you don't need to take a full bath anymore because you just took a bath maybe an hour ago, but then you walked across the street, you know, back in the Bible days, uh, the street was dusty and they have on sandals, they got dust on their feet. So now they need to have their feet washed. They don't need a whole shower, but they do need to have their feet washed. And those are the two types of forgiveness that we have. There's the forgiveness of salvation that only happens once. It, you're cleansed your whole body. But now we still sin and we need to have our feet washed by Jesus. We need that day by day forgiveness to restore the fellowship because the fellowship is still broken with God when we sin. In the book of Isaiah 62, it says that the Lord's ear, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God and, and your iniquities have hid his face from you that he will not hear. He could hear if you wanted to, but he will not hear because sin separates between you and your God. It's not just that sin separates between people that don't have him as their God. He's your God, but your sins separate. And that's true for us today. There's a, there's a, a broken fellowship whenever we sin. We all have sin in our lives. Knowing that we have that problem is the first step. Because if somebody doesn't know they have a problem, they usually won't correct it. Somebody's not going to go and get cancer treatment unless they believe that they have the cancer. If somebody just says, hey, you know, some guy off the street. I think you probably have cancer. You're not feeling good? Sounds like cancer to me. You know, you may not, you may not rush to a doctor and get, because those cancer treatments are awful from what I've heard. You know, they, they burn you and they cut you. They do chemotherapy and radiation and they, they just tear you down. It's horrible. But if it gets the cancer, then I guess it was worth it, you know, if you didn't die. But nobody wants to subject themselves to that unless they believe it. And people will not go to God and ask for the cure unless they know they have a, a problem, unless they have sin, unless they know that they have sin. So number one, we all have sin in our lives. Number two, that sin is the worst problem we have. It's not that guy at work, you know. It's not your spouse. It's not your kids or your parents. It's not the boss that just oh, it gets on my nerves. The worst problem we have is not a financial problem or a medical problem. And those are big problems. But the worst problem that every one of us has in life is that person in the mirror. It's ourselves. We are our worst enemies. And the things that we do in our flesh that sin is the worst problem we have because no one and no thing can separate you from God, but your sin can. Your sin can separate you from the fellowship of God. Look at Isaiah. Um, well, we, I already mentioned that passage, but in Isaiah 59, where it says that our iniquities have separated between you and your God. And that's why our sin is the worst thing. And then number three, we can only overcome that sin with God's power. 
It's not enough to know that I have sin and that it's my worst enemy and say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to get over it. I'm going to turn over a new leaf in my life. You can't. The Bible says that the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit lusteth against the flesh. They're contrary to one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. There are people that have tried. Oh, I hate that. I'm just going to stop doing it. I'm done. But here you are again. And we can't overcome it with our own strength. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can't get forgiveness of that sin on my own. And I can't get the power to overcome it on my own. But both are available with Jesus. And so there's two things that need to, need to happen. There needs to be forgiveness and there needs to be forsaking. Forgiveness, you can't, you can't forgive yourself. I've heard people say this before. You know, I did this before, but I've come to a place where I've forgiven myself. Oh, that's pretty neat. You forgave yourself. That's great. Why don't you go before the judge when you, uh, you know, judge, I, uh, I robbed the bank, but don't worry, I forgave myself. <laughs> oh, you forgave yourself. All right, well, we're all done. You can go free. You can't forgive yourself of sin. Who can forgive sins but God only? And Jesus is the only one. God, through Jesus, is the only one that will forgive our sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And then to forsake. The Bible says, he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And God is the one who enables us to be able to forsake the sin. It's like a dog. The Bible gives this illustration. A dog that returns to his vomit. You probably don't want me to talk about this, do you? <laughs> this is uh, what God says, that a dog will, will throw up and, oh, it feels better, but it leaves and comes back a little bit later and it, that doesn't look as bad as it used to look right when I threw up. And he eats it again. What's wrong with you? He's a dog. One of the things that makes a dog a dog. It's one of the reasons that humans are higher than, than dogs. But no, we do the same thing sometimes. As a dog returns to his vomit, some believers, some Christians go back to their sin, even though they've already been forgiven of that. They return and they're doing it again. In the other picture, it gives us as, a, as the sow or as the pig that was washed to its wallowing in the mire. Get the pig out of the mud, clean it all up, goes right back to the mud. Just loves to, maybe it's because he's, it's, it's hot day and the mud's nice and cool, or he's just like, I don't like to be clean. I want to be dirty. And he just wallows around in it. And that's the picture. And then he comes and jumps in your bed. You know, now you've got pig mud in your bed. And um, we can relate. To, we're piggets in our house. So I can relate to that. The kids will leave stuff in our beds. But it's an offense to God. And God gives us those pictures that are offensive to us to let us know what it's like to God. When we say, thank you, God, for forgiving me, and we go and dive back into it, we need to forsake it, and we can only do this consistently with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, until we get to heaven, we're, we're always going to struggle with sin. In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And the Apostle Paul got to the place in his life where he says, O wretched man that I am, the things that I want to do, I don't do them. Things that I don't want to do, I'm doing them wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can be delivered from this. We can forsake sin, but it can only come through crying out to God for his help. And then day by day, rubber meets the road, just yielding to him. When the Holy Spirit says, don't do that. I just need to say, I'm not going to do that. And sometimes we, we need more encouragement and accountability. If you tell somebody else about your struggle, a couple of things happen. One, it breaks us down. It's humbling. We don't want, we don't want anyone to know that we're sinful. You're a sinner still? Do you know if you tell someone that you're a sinner, you're telling someone that is a sinner. He, he also knows that himself is a sinner or herself. So, it's not that we are telling a sinless person and they're shocked that you're a sinner. You're a sinner. I'm not anymore. We're all sinners. But sometimes it, it helps us. It's a, so one, it's humbling to do that. But number two, it is a strength to us. If you tell someone, you know, when we go out, pick an activity. You know, I used to do drugs. When we go out, I don't want to do drugs anymore. So I'm just telling you that. I've 
made God a promise and I've decided I'm not going to do drugs anymore. I want to tell you so that if I start to do it, you say, hey, what about that decision you made? Hey, what about that promise? Oh yeah, thanks. And it can be a strength. But if you don't tell anybody, then there's not someone to help you, to keep you accountable. And so as is needed and necessary, have the Lord lead you. Sometimes the best thing you can do is tell God and then tell somebody else. Will you pray for me? Will you ask me how I'm doing this in this area? And that's why God gives us, that's why two are better than one. That's why God gives us each other. It'd be like going to the dentist. Anybody like to go to the dentist? It's often, it's in the top 10, maybe top 10 lists of phobias and things that people hate. I don't like to go to the dentist because, first of all, he gets out the, that big woman, Gertrude, and she starts to floss. You haven't been flossing, have you? I've got some blood here. I've got some blood coming out. It's like, okay, fine. I haven't been flossing. But people don't like to go to the dentist because because uh, they're not perfect. And the point, oh, I found another cavity. Hey, got a cavity. I'm going to, ah, you know, root canal and thousands of dollars. If I just stay home, then I feel good about myself. I can eat all the Oreos I want, get it all in my teeth, and, I, and the dentist doesn't, not there to care. But if you have a cavity because of eating junk food, and then they fill it, or if it's so bad they have to replace the tooth, they, they give you a whole mouthful of new teeth. Wonderful. Now I can go back to eating all the junk again. No, you shouldn't do that, because that's what got, got you in this problem in the first place. And so we need to confess our sin, be forgiven, to be renewed and cleansed, and then we need to forsake it. God wants us to live in victory, to live in holiness. We have a great need for holiness, and in the next several weeks, we're going to divide up sin into some different categories that can help us to be more specific in our lives, in our confession to God. Instead of just saying, God, let's see, yesterday, just forgive me for all my sin. If we think that way about it, then we're probably going to go back to a lot of the sins. But if we get specific, God, I said this yesterday. Will you forgive me of that? And help me to find out what I can do to not say that again, to not do that again. The more specific we are with confession, the more specific God can be with forgiveness, and the more specific we can be with forsaking. But the more broad we are, we're going to, we're going to be like the guy eating Oreos again. We're going to be like the, the pig wallowing in the mire again. We're going to be like the dog eating his vomit. Can you get that picture in your head the next time you do a sin you've done before? You, you, you confess it to God. He forgave you, and you're doing it again. Just ask God to put that picture in your mind. A dog eating his vomit. That's what we're doing, and that's what it's like to God. Let's close together in prayer. Lord, we thank you that forgiveness is possible with you. It's guaranteed if we will confess our sins. Help us to know that as believers, the greatest problem we have is our sin. We have a great need for holiness. We have a great need for being set apart from sin. And this is impossible in our own strength. But through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, through your power, we can do this. And I pray that we would not only for our own selves to have your power in our lives desire this, but so that we can be proper ambassadors to those around us, so that we can show the world what you are like, so that we can show the world what a redeemed, forgiven sinner can be, so that they can have hope as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching today. If you have made a decision to follow God in some way or would like prayer, let us know flbc at cox.net. We would love to connect with you, pray for you, or send you some resources that can help you in your walk with God. If you would like to know more about how to go to heaven, visit us at folbaptist.com slash heaven. If you would like to give financially to support our ministry, you can do so at folbaptist.com slash give. Thank you and God bless you.